I'll begin by acknowledging the Wurundjeri people, the traditional owners of this land here on which we are meeting, and I particularly do that as a consequence of the education and our belief that they have their own way of learning and we can learn from that. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present, and I pay respects to any Indigenous people who are with us. Stephen, Nathan, thank you very much for inviting me to be part of this great project. It's been a, an honour and a privilege. Phil and Hugh, very nice to be with you again. Um, Phil, it's been a while since we were on the same stage together, but I follow you and um, thank God they're still jobs. Um, to my Deacon colleagues, I see a number of them in the room and our Deacon partners with them. It's really great of you to come. It's nice to have some, some friends here. Ladies and gentlemen, um, universities have traditionally been known as resistant to change. And if you forgive an old joke, how many academics does it take to change a light bulb? Change? Change? Who's talking about change is usually the answer that you get. And at the beginning of this century, before the advent of the great iPhone, it would be fair to say that the basic building blocks of universities, their governance, their business model, their instructional design, had changed little since the first university was established in Bologna in 1088. And if you look at the slide, the only difference there really is there's not many women, there's still a teacher at the front, and the clothes we wear today are slightly more curious. In contrast today, of course, the era of the mobile phone and app innovations, when almost every time universities now come up in conversation, it is coupled with epithets portraying mega change, a revolution, a tsunami, and veritable avalanche coming towards us. Same may, some may be calling this too soon. Our demise may not be certain. And what I want to talk to today is the role of universities in skilling people for the jobs of the future and what this means in our current environment. We, you will all relax, of course. Um, I've just written a note here. Phyllis just told us there will be jobs. It's just that we're not sure how we're going to get to them. And I think there's an interesting statement there about doom is that what I'm about to say, some of it is quite negative, but I do so from an optimistic perspective that change, and if we address our change, will get us where we went to go. Today's markets represent, therefore, something of a paradigm shift. It's a complex, crowded, connected place. The Asian century is in play, and it seems the action is very much in our part of the globe. The India and China together account for 2.5 billion people, and if you include Indonesia, that's getting to well over half the people in the world, all in our region, all in our time zone. And our Asian neighbors are active, see the future as clearly as we do. China's research and development, for example, their budget has quadrupled last year, and it has more than doubled in Singapore, in South Korea, and in Japan. Meanwhile, in Australia, most education funding is now contestable, it's seen as a cost, and worryingly, there is an absence of a national vision or strategy for dealing with the future in a machine-driven world where the indicators suggest everything, everything will be different. Asian universities have continued their climb up the global rankings. They now represent about an eighth of the top 200 in the Times Higher Education World Rankings. What this means is that countries that have traditionally been our major markets have become our competitors, that outsourcing of international education, our great, our great contribution to Australia. China is now the third most popular international study destination behind the United States and the United Kingdom, with Australia slipping to sixth place behind France and Germany. This is a shift, and it is against us despite the papers yesterday suggesting we'd had our best ever international student enrolments this year. But of course, it's all relative. Every nation now competes. Publicly funded, privately funded providers compete. Big international players with international campuses compete. The growing Asian market, market and in all of this, in all of this, what it is, that we Australians should do. On a large island with a sparse population of 23 million of mostly reasonably well off and well satisfied citizens, what must we do? Well, one thing we do know is that modern successful nations are mostly well educated and skilled, most particularly in the STEM skills, science, technology, 
engineering and mathematics, and in the application of those skills. Successful nations are well educated and they apply the skills from STEM. The big powers, China, India, Germany and France, all know they must expand education to their people for the challenges of the future, which is different, a different future. And that brings me nicely to use the analogy of MOOCs, Massive Open Online Courses, and why I see them as a signal of disruption. They are a signal that our world, our education world, has altered for good. MOOCs offer free to Online education is not new, but MOOCs represent the first wave of disruptive change, I think, for universities and how they transmit that knowledge and how they educate the next generations. I think I've gone one too quick. There we are. MOOCs offer free tuition for all. They have enrolments counted in the millions, and mostly they have very enticing titles. I would be shocked that on every table in this room there is not someone who's done at least one MOOC. I've completed one and I've done about eight. I've gone out of two, I'm a biochemist by training, and I was horrified at how bad they were. But what has happened in the blink of one year, in the blink of one year, online education went from poor relation to leading edge, uber cool status. Everybody is now in the cloud, and you'll hear more about that soon. MOOCs have freed us from fixed concepts of meritocratic selection, from preconceived notions of who should go to university and when that might happen. The large Asian and European markets have shown great interest in the capacity of MOOCs to offer a cost-effective alternative for large populations previously without hope of access of any kind of higher education. And now, today, the US may still be the world's education technology leader, but Asia has become its most critical testing ground. Asia has the world's largest pool of K-12 and college enrollments and deep internet, deep internet and social media inter penetration. 46% of the world's internet users are in Asia, and probably we in Australia will compete with them in creation of the jobs of the future. So will MOOCs replace place-based universities like all of the ones in this, in this country? Probably no, but they are the first wave of disruption. MOOCs are perhaps the canary in the mine. Stanford professor Susan Holmes has a point when she says, and I quote, I don't think you get a Stanford education online, just as I don't think Facebook gives you a social life. Well, I'm not so sure. I think it depends when you how you class social life, and next gen will definitely do it differently from us, old gen. MOOCs are free, there is no business plan, and many have scoffed at the idea that they can do anything. But I remember the Amazon journey, and we all know it. The now dead giant Borders, the bookshop, sold its annoying list of e-list books, its e-books, to a small startup which for many, many years made nothing, made nothing, and today is a global brand. Amazon is the world's retail distributor for almost everything. Is there a message in this for all of us? I think there might be. The most significant impact, I think, of MOOCs is the output of the new technologies, which have changed how we think about learning and the skills this produces and how people can access them. We can now, in my university, segment, target, predict, and describe information in ways that were unimagined five years ago. We have new ways of collecting, thinking about information, and new ways of linking data sets to generate new insights about learning and about teaching. Learning analytics doesn't just measure how students progress. It can now shape it, giving students opportunities to improve and develop while a course is in progress, and they can do this for themselves. In future, the challenges for universities in using learning anal analytics to build ever stronger links between data, teaching, and learning, and to maintain a focus on developing the skills and knowledge that we value in our society, a big change indeed. New technologies are starting to change the way we think about how we teach, but crucially, it's changing the way our students think about their learning and where they'll get it. 
few university students today are solely on, on campus with no access to the cloud or wholly on campus, simply receiving and absorbing learning resources digitally. They're sometimes on and they're sometimes in the cloud and sometimes they're on campus and they're in the cloud and there could be a lecture going on over there, but heck, why do I need to go? I'd rather talk to my friend, I'll down that later in the cloud when I get home. You get the story. Our students do travel occasionally to university, as I've said, and when they get there, they expect technology-rich learning spaces, ubiquitous fast Wi-Fi, and of course in Victoria, great coffee. But the key, the key is they no longer need to come. They don't have to come to campus too often anymore, and many can get all their learning from wherever they are and when they want it. The flexibility we now have for people with work, with family, this flexibility is invaluable. Our fast-changing economy means that we can expect to see an older cohort as students re-enter education multiple times. All of you in this room, get ready for it. Well, you will enter education multiple times to keep pace and keep in reinforcing your workforce skill requirements. Deloitte's 2014 report predicts and suggests that skills have a half-life of about two and a half to five years. This flexibility has happened fast. We now worry about things. How do you access the quality of online learning in the age of cloud-based training? How do you assess um, the quality of the content? Some MOOCs are absolutely dreadful. Others are pure genius. How is online assessment going to be free of cheating? This is an obsession of the media just at the moment. People ask as if there has never been cheating in an exam room ever. May I remind you that since 1088, in Bologna, it has been recorded that cheating existent, existed. None of these things about quality, about cheating, and about access are new. Ultimately, of course, it's none of these things that matter. It's the quality of outcomes that matter. Outcomes from higher education for 99% of the world's population mean jobs. Will employers continue to value university degrees over a digital badge from edX or Coursera, the great big MOOC providers at the moment? Could graduates entice employers with half a dozen prestige MOOCs on their CVs in place of a three-year degree in business or computing? So the big question for me is, will degrees, the ancient rite of passage, survive the decade, or will a new way of badging and credentialing begin appearing? Shorter, faster, cheater, cheaper, just in time for me, will this happen? Well, probably. The late Steve Jobs take, the late Steve Jobs take on quality was that, and I quote, people don't know what they want until they see it the great iPhone. And so I think it does, what will matter for us is what will our students, what will our students, the children in year three, four and five now, expect from their education in 2025? A well-paid job, a better understanding of the world, an exciting lifestyle, all of these, probably. And my final point, about all of this is what does digital disruption mean to the jobs and skills of our future? It seems to me that in an age with vast quantities of information, instantly available, outdated almost as instantly, the ability to deal nimbly with complex and often ambiguous knowledge is far more important than the accumulation of facts which can be regurgitated, however stylishly. Emergent leadership and teamwork entrepreneurship, intercultural communication, emotional intelligence, on-the-job experience. These are the skills the employers of the future will be looking for. Content will become a given and an expectation from your employers that you will update your knowledge base yourself when you need it. In a constantly connected world, graduates will also need improved cultural awareness, global contacts and skills essential for that marketplace in the cloud. The connection between work and learning will become closer, and I believe work-based learning opportunities will begin to have a more critical place in preparing graduates for those jobs and those skills of their futures. In this second machine age, unlike the age of STEAM, the evolution of cognitive computing has moved into areas previously believed to be beyond the reach of technology. 
as smart machines take over routine manufacturing and probably many of the process jobs that currently exist in our world. There will be an increasing demand for the kind of skills machines are not good at, the thinking skills that can't be codified. We will need people with a firm grounding in coding. Did I mention coding? Why is it that Australia has tuned out of teaching our year five, six and sevens to code and the great opportunity of that market has gone to the United States? We need a firm grounding in coding for everyone. We need science, we need technology, we need engineering and we need mathematics. We will all be working with machines. What will those jobs be? I have no idea. Five years ago, no one knew what an app was. Now there are 50,000 app developers. In five years' time, machine algorithmic designer, machine communication specialists, how do you get machines to talk to each other, robotic lifestyle integration consultants, I still think there'll be podiatrists, life specialists, and all the rest. The billion dollar question, of course, will be how will we keep pace with technological infrastructure and remain competitive in an increasingly complex global market. Universities will need to worry less about what the actual jobs are and more about equipping our people to be thoughtful, to be entrepreneurial and to be forward looking. And so in conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, we ask a great deal of our universities to prepare future leaders, to train employees, to provide a creative base for scientific discovery, to transmit culture, create new knowledge, to nurture and to fill the deep human desire to understand ourselves and the world we inhabit and will inherit. We know knowledge is replacing other resources as the main driver of economic growth. And education has increasingly become the foundation of individual prosperity and social mobility. And importantly, it is important for national well-being, regional power and advantage. So ladies and gentlemen, I end with a, um, by quoting that Robert Kennedy once famously said, we live in interesting times, in times of opportunity and huge advances. And I say, we need to pay attention and take a few risks. I think in education, it is well over time to pay attention to the changes we face to take those risks. Our future, our collective future, certainly depends upon it. Thank you.